Well, after your career, where you actually changed a lot of people's lives um, in your broadcasting career, I'm reaching for a segue there, but I'm talking about specifically <laughs> one of the great programs in Australian history, Who Dares Wins. That's that's what I, that's what I really want to talk about. And obviously, you've been is, talking about it all morning. I have been actually. talking about it all morning, and I've reached out or, to. A few. Or have you been talking about Tanya? Well, that's actually why we've got you on. This is this is, <laughs> this is a gateway for me to get Tanya Zanetta's phone number. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but um. You know, I mean, there's some. I was talking to my sister last night and just reminiscing on some of the great, <laughs> some of the great dares. There was one where you were down at Sydney Harbour and there was some people on lunch break. This is in the nineties and it was fifty dollars to jump into Sydney Harbour fully clothed. <laughs> um, people drinking in the nineties. In the nineties, lot, lot, lot of money back, a lot of money back then. But you know, uh, you know, uh, there was you know the wheat bix challenge. Um, yeah. There was the, you know people drinking ostrich eggs. Uh, yeah, you know, I remember a sheep's eyeball, eat a sheep's eyeball for 50 bucks. Yeah, there was some really <laughs> weird things. Some really weird things that's going right, on. That's why I was going to ask you. So what, was, is there anything, was there an incident or like a, you know, a challenge or whatever that really stands out in the mind of like, well, that was one of the weirdest things I've ever seen? Oh, yeah. Uh, the whole show? Week. <laughs> oh. Look, there'd never been a show made like that. And they were the real early days of reality TV. I mean, that mm. term didn't exist then. We got nominated in a couple of Logie categories, but it was for entertainment. The yeah. word reality TV didn't exist. Mm. So it was well before its time. And to go out on the street and dare people for money as live, I mean, of course, we're filming it, went back, got edited, but it was as, as live. It was like you were there. Yeah. It had never been done before. Uh, I'd worked at the ABC with one of the blokes who thought up the idea. There were two English guys. And he rang me up, and I'd already started at seven doing Sydney Weekender. And he rang me up and said, we've, we've got this show, mate, and we think you can do it. <laughs> and we're going to we're gonna talk to Channel 7. And if they buy it, because you're already there, we want you to host the show. So within a couple of weeks, that all happened. And next minute, we're out on the street. there And, and as the show went on, of course, what was a big deal in Series 1 was nothing in series three or four. So they just kept having to up the ante yeah. all the time. And look, I, mean, I think there was a bit lost in translation as well because that last dare, the main dare, where if you succeeded in the main dare, you want to trip around the world. Yeah. The people who wrote in were generally the families. And they would tell us that these people, um, my husband's a great man, great father, um, a great uncle, you know, great great grandfather, blah, 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 really hard worker, beautiful person, but he needs a break and we need to challenge him. He's getting lazy and his greatest fear is this. So we knew what their greatest fear was. Because mm, people, would, people would come up to me on the street, go, I'd do any of them dares on the show. And I go, yeah, mate, <laughs> yeah all the time. I used yeah. to get guys coming up to me going, I'm former SAS, I'll go on that show and do any dare you want me to do. Yeah. And I go, but man, we don't want guys like you on the show. Yeah. We yeah. actually want the bloke who lives next door, yeah. who's an accountant, who's getting a bit lazy, and we know that he's shit scared of heights, so we're going to put him up in a helicopter and ask him <laughs> to bungee jump out of it. <laughs> and that's, that's the way it worked. We found out what your greatest fear was, mm. and we exposed that. And what did that do for people? Well, I'll tell you what, there was a number of people that succeeded in those days, and some of them ended up on the speaking circuit mm. doing motivational talks, mm. stuff like this. It was really unbelievable, mm. the effect that that show had. Mm. We finished making it in about 97, 98, and as you quite rightly said, boy, people are still talking about that show and asking me on a weekly basis, oh, are you going to dare me or what about that there or where's Tanya? We love Tanya. <laughs> So, yeah, all the blokes ask me that. Where Tanya was fantastic, mate. <laughs> Tanya, believe it or not, now, I don't know how many people know this. If you, I have triplets that are 26 years old and buying two girls. Tanya had twins about five years ago. So between us, we've got triplets and twins. What was in the water? <laughs> and who dares win? And for $50, it we're going to find out with. <laughs> yeah. But Tanya still looks the same. She is gorgeous. We talk a couple of times a year. That show for her launched her into superstardom. Mm. She went and did Bollywood. She lived in England for 10 years and was the face of of, uh, of, of beer commercials and Nike shoes and all this sort of stuff. Mm. She did great out of it. A real go-getter, Tanya. Love her. Mm. Mm. 
One last thing, Wit, and uh, I've asked this to a few people before, but um, obviously we know. No, it's not about Gladiator. It's about sandpaper. Um, <laughs> you know, so the affair's completely over, as you know, consigned to the history books, fully except only three people knew what was going on. Um, no one else had a clue what was going on. Um, they never used those tactics in previous series against England. Um, Wolf Lehman didn't know what was going on. Uh, he, didn't no, he didn't know. Uh, he didn't, didn't know. Didn't have a clue. Um, no one knew. Given literally everything's better in your era, you know, what was the best way to secretly get the ball talking um, aside from 80 grit sandpaper down the pants? A um, little bit of Vaseline in your shoelaces <laughs> always went well on the shiny side, you know. Bit of, bit of, bit of uh, uh, UV suntan cream on the fire. Look, everything's been used. Yeah. Yeah. This is the, the thing I got asked about it immediately, of course. I said ball camping's been going on since day one and will go on until the last game of cricket's ever played. Mm-hmm. When someone's either lifting the scene, maybe scratching the ball. Look, it really come to awareness with us when the Pakistanis started swinging the ball Irish mm. and we couldn't work out how that was happening. And, and then we got told, you know, some of the subcontinent guys are actually scratching it with a bottle top or they've mm. got a long nail and they're roughing up this one side it's of the ball. It's just really good wrist position. It's just mm. that solid. It's just, wrist. just wrist release point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, really, it's really good wrist position. <laughs> so, yeah, look, it's been going on a long time. If I have a ball tampered, well, you know, if cleaning out a bit of grass in the seam and trying to lift the seam back into its original position is ball tampering, maybe I'm guilty of that. Mm. Um, I can't, I've never, never rubbed any substance on it. I mean, I was a big enough sweater and played with Merv Hughes, who's the biggest sweater in the history of the world. So we didn't need much substance to rub it on there and try and shine it up. But, yeah, it was an amazing whole episode that I just couldn't work out how they didn't think they were going to get seen with 37 cameras at the ground now. But when I played, there were six cameras at the ground and only four worked at the one time or something. Mm. So it, it was really crazy. But I'd also heard, look, and I'll... I'll give you this. I spoke to people after that series, and they said that series was brutal. Mm. And when you go to South Africa, I mean, they're like us. They'll, they'll, they'll fight until the last breath for South Africans. But the crowds over there, man, and the press and the people, and we'd really been given it. And there were suspicions that they'd been ball tampering in the first couple of tests as well or doing something to the ball. Mm. So that's not to legitimise what we did. That's not to say what we did was right, what we did was wrong, and people suffered for a year, but it was a really nasty, volatile series. And, well, you saw, you know, a couple of guys nearly punching on, David Warner, and mm. it was a de Kock, Went to Kock yeah. going into the race. I mean, I've never seen that. Mm. It never goes off the field, man. Mm. You can be abused on the field. It never gets to the point where you're punching on in the race going into the dressing room. So when I saw that, I thought, ooh, man, there's some ugly words being traded out there. And it was really vicious and a really heavy series. But you just can't <laughs> take sandpaper out onto the ground and <laughs> scratch the ball on it and not get caught and think that it's okay. It wasn't okay. Mm. It was crazy.